Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Say goodbye to the rain and hello to the snow. Multiple chances of that. We'll look at it straight ahead. And she thought she got away with it. A home security camera rolls as this woman steals a package from a St. Clair Shores porch. We begin with breaking news from Lansing and Michigan's recount battle. A key hearing happening right now to determine if the recount continues. As recounts began in Wayne and Macomb counties and continue in Oakland County today, Donald Trump and his Republican forces are fighting to have those recounts halted on two fronts. They are appealing a federal judge's ruling that the recounts must proceed and also taking their objections to the state court of appeals. Let's get to Guy Gordon in Lansing tonight and Guy is live. Guy, that hearing was scheduled to start about four o'clock. It's still going on now. It certainly is, Kimberly and Steve, and it all comes down to the definition of one word, that word being aggrieved, a word that was drafted more than 100 years ago when this election law was written. And what justices or the judges in this case are trying to determine is what those legislators meant. What was their intent? Jill Stein says that she was aggrieved by unspecified mistake or fraud in this election. Here's what the Trump forces are objecting to with that. They say that she cannot be aggrieved under the definition because she has no chance of winning. Only had 1% of the vote. Also, they say she must provide evidence. And the statute does say it, quote, must set forth as near as possible the nature and character of the fraud or mistakes alleged. But the forces for Jill Stein say that the law is silent on the margin of victory or loss, that that doesn't matter. She just must make an allegation of impropriety. And that evidence is not mandatory because the statute also says, quote, the petitioner is only required to allege fraud or a mistake in the petition without further specification. Here's the crux of their arguments. If there's information they have that there's been large scale hacking that could have changed the results of our election, don't you think that the Board of Canvassers would be interested if they have facts of that basis don't you think that the board of canvassers would want to investigate that but it wasn't included in the petition but respectfully this court has no authority under the supremacy clause and binding precedents of the united states supreme court to interfere in any way with a federal court order and that is one of the big issues here. If this court uh, puts forth a remedy, will it be in conflict with the federal court and who has precedence there? It does appear that the Mark Goldsmith decision of Sunday night did leave the door open to another decision. And even uh, Peter O'Connell, the presiding judge in this case, said that that was a very narrowly focused case, looking only at the two-day delay and whether or not they had to move forward. They did move forward, but that doesn't say that it couldn't be stopped. At least that was uh, what he was suggesting from the bench. They are still going with those oral arguments. Another major development today, Attorney General Bill Schutte did join the uh, appeal at the appellate level for the federal decision saying that the federal courts have no jurisdiction to meddle in Michigan uh, election law. So that's moving forward. This will move forward. If there's a decision, we'll get back to you right away. That was, that's where things stand right now from the Court of Appeals. I'm Guy Gordon, Local 4. Kimberly and Steve, back to you. Guy, nobody wants to go out on a limb and carve new legal territory. So is there some case law that gives the panel precedence to lean on? Absolutely none, Steve, and that is the problem. We've got 100 years of election law, but any case that uh, approached this nat nature of what is aggrieved has always been in a race where there was only that much difference between the two candidates, where there actually was a, a possibility of changing the outcome. She would have to get a two million vote change here. There's no possibility of that, so we are in uncharted waters. Well, I guess there's been a lot of precedent set in this election year, so this continues it. Thank you, Guy. <laughs> to say the least. What a year, <laughs> huh? Our other top story tonight, a wild scene inside a Detroit pawn shop as a stabbing victim runs inside to get some help. This all happened at American Jewelry and Loan right at 8 Mile in Greenfield. Coco McAvoy is live at the home nearby where it all went down. And Coco, what, what happened here? Kimberly and Steve, a very odd situation. The incident all happened here at this home and left behind a very big mess. And we spoke to neighbors in the area who are just stunned after witnessing the aftermath. Pull up the street from work to see that. That was just like, 
what the heck is really, really going on? Well, police say a woman who lives at this house was trying to move out with her boyfriend when her son came home and the two men got into a fight, both stabbing each other and leaving a violent scene behind. What happened from there was all witnessed by Denise Bowden. I jumped out my car and I was like, what happened to you? And he was saying his mother boyfriend, he had a fight with the man. He didn't even know what was going on, but he stabbed him in the throat and in the head. Bowden did what she could to help. The police got here before the ambulance got here. She said she wrapped a towel around the man's head until the ambulance arrived. That boy was bloody. I mean, bloody, real bloody. As for the other man, Police say he walked a half a mile to the American Jewelry and Loan on 8 Mile and Greenfield, covered in blood and asking for help. Right now, no one knows what started that fight and how it led to all of this. But neighbors know one thing for sure. That wasn't called for or necessary. We know both men are currently in temporary serious condition, so we'll, of course, keep checking in with police to learn more information about this story. Reporting live this evening, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. So, Coco, was anybody taken into custody? Yes, Kimberly, we did learn from police that someone was taken into custody. We don't know if both men were taken into custody, but for sure that one of them was, and that man was taken into custody actually at that pawn shop. All right, really bizarre. Okay, Coco, thanks. It sounds like this story could change as the evening wears on, but right now we have some rain that's making the commute a challenge. That we do, and this rain has some chillier weather coming along with us. So let's get over to Ben for more. Hi, Ben. Yeah, guys, we are looking at colder air moving in here, but the rain is on its way out. In fact, it's on its last legs right now. Just a couple sprinkles left here in parts of Sanilac and St. Clair counties. We may see another slight uh, pushed out here in our north zone uh, when we get closer to about 7 o'clock, but we're really turning our attention to what's coming later in the forecast. Tomorrow we just start the cool down. We really start to see that cold air move in Thursday and Friday, along with some lake effect snow showers, a little bit of a break Saturday, and then Sunday is the real deal. We'll find out if we've got the shovels at the ready for the weekend. That and your four zone forecast coming up in a few minutes. Kim. All right, thank you, Ben. Police investigating after a fire sent a Ford employee to the hospital. It happened this afternoon outside Ford's Dearborn stamping plant. Our propane filling station caught fire. One person suffered some burns. The cause of that fire is unknown at this time. The man charged with killing a Detroit officer in what police say was a drug-fueled hit-and-run crash was in court today. Stephen Guzina is facing six charges, including murder and the death of Officer Myron Jarrett. Let's get to our Rod Maloney live. And Rod, a lot of new details came to light today. Yeah, Kimberly, and let's remember this was a traffic stop that happened on Pier to Detroit's west side back in October. 54 year old Steve Guzina is allegedly uh, the driver or person behind the wheel that had, was in a white panel van that slammed into two cars that were stopped by two other police cars. And Officer Jarrett was standing outside when that accident happened. The vehicles got moved forward as part of that accident and they hit the officer. Highly calm testimony, but still emotional if you pay close attention to it about what happened that night. I, I noticed he was still breathing. Um, like I said, he was unresponsive, so I tried to uh, do uh, chest rubs just to try and get some type of movement out of them, and I was unsuccessful with that. Imagine the difficulty of trying to calmly explain what you did to try and save the life of a badly injured colleague. That was the tough task for Detroit police officer Marvin Anthony today, who had to climb out of the window of his scout car after it was hit by the white panel van that you see in this video that happened in early October. The accident happens in the top right-hand corner of your TV screen. This vehicle was still what appeared to be drivable to me, so we uh, put him in the rear of his scout car, and uh, I drove him to Sinai Grace Hospital. Sadly, Officer Jarrett died there. Detroit homicide detective Moises Jimenez interviewed Guzina the next day, and Guzina confessed. I am so, so sorry. I wish I could trade places. Police officer will accomplish more in one year than I would in a lifetime. To the whole police department, I'm sorry. I wish I could think of a stronger word than sorry, because sorry does not seem strong enough. The judge bound Gazina over for trial. Jared's wife, Sasha, said this afterward. I'm happy with the outcome. 
glad the judge made the decision that she did. And I'm just hoping for justice for my husband. Guzin is charged with six counts, including second degree murder, leaving the scene of an accident, also operating under the influence. Back to you. All right, Steve Garagiola reporting live for us tonight. A Madison Heights police officer was taken to the hospital this morning after his police car was hit by an SUV. Yeah, this happened about 530 this morning at the intersection of Dartmouth and University Avenue in Madison Heights. The officer was on his way to a call when the SUV blew a stop sign and hit the patrol car. That officer was taken to the hospital with minor injuries. He was treated and released. Staying in Madison Heights, an investigation is underway after a car crashed into a jewelry store. Uh, here's some video of workers repairing the huge hole left in the back of Diamond Jim's custom jewelry at 11 Mile near I-75. Police say somebody crashed into the store overnight and they just took off. The suspected car was later found abandoned on I-75. At this point, it's unclear if anything was stolen from the store. All right, here's Nick Monticelli with a look at what he has ahead here at 5. A young mother of two killed in a carjacking attempt and her own 11 year old son saw the entire thing and that son helped put his mom's killer behind bars. I can stand up straight and like I'm brave because I came here today. And some brand new information in a case that has gripped the west side of the state. We'll hear what one witness claims he saw before Jessica Haringa disappeared from her job at a gas station. A St. Clair Shores package thief thought she was pretty slick stuff poaching presents from porches. That is until, of course, she got caught on video. I'll have a live report coming up next. Tonight, new at 6. First responders come to Lansing to battle against attempts to cut their retiree health care. What happened and why they're calling it a major victory. Coco? A man breaks into a house on Detroit's west side and assaults the two women inside. And now neighbors are questioning their safety. We'll have that story on Local 4. All right, check out this home security camera video. This is from St. Clair Shores. A woman caught on camera stealing a package right in front of the home. This all happened yesterday evening, and thanks to this video, police were able to quickly make an arrest. Let's get to our Mar McDonald Live in Mar. This is a big problem all across Metro Detroit and the country. It sure is, especially this time of year, all sorts of Christmas presents getting poached. But, you know, home surveillance has become so slick. Most of the time, these thieves have no idea they're caught on camera, just like this one. Because nothing says Merry Christmas like package thieves cruising nice neighborhoods hoping you're away while your Christmas presents are delivered. This woman was busted on a St. Clair Shores home surveillance system, poaching a package, and that video has led to this. Christina Pollack. St. Clair Shores police busted her for the package thievery and turns out she has a history of retail fraud and lives in a nearby condo complex. The victim in all of this has no idea who her alleged thief is. She did not know this suspect personally, even nor as a neighbor. The judge hearing the case gave her a bond, but also a tether. She can't go anywhere near the home or the neighborhood she's accused of victimizing. It's a season where more packages are going to be delivered than not. And it's a season where when some of these packages don't don't get delivered, then it could throw somebody's whole Christmas in disarray. And and I think the uh, people in your area are entitled to not have that worry. Back here alive, you know, that homeowner has a pretty nice surveillance system. So you might wonder, well, why do they have that? Are they just that proactive? Well, it turns out their home has been victimized multiple times by package thieves, at least three or four. They got fed up and put in a pretty spiffy, slick camera, caught the whole thing on tape. Kimberly. Back to you. Well, you can't much blame them, Mara, and those cameras are getting uh, less and less expensive <laughs> after it's, it already happened once. Just curious, any idea what's in the package? Not that it mattered, but were they Christmas they, gifts? They wouldn't say that they, 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 it was Christmas gifts, but they wouldn't say exactly what, only that the value is greater than 200 but less than 1000 mm -hmm. Just shameful that somebody would do that, though. All right, Mar, we appreciate it. Michigan lawmakers are looking to make the penalty for underage drinking a little bit lighter. The House voted today for a change to the law that will make the first offense a civil infraction instead of a misdemeanor. The maximum fine would stay at $100. The bill sponsor says the minor in possession law is clogging up the courts 
And really, it's hurting young people who are trying to get into college or get jobs. The Senate has passed the legislation. Now it moves to Governor Snyder's desk. Before we get to weather, I need to apologize for something. I know who you are, Steve Garagio. Ben <laughs> Bailey. <laughs> You're Ben Bailey. Yes. Uh, no, I, I said that that was you out there. And you it's were cold. Right here. Your brain freezes That's up once right. in a while. It's, it happens. It's a little chilly. That's right. That's <laughs> He's what sitting right next to you. I can see where you would say that. <laughs> it it happens. happens. That's right, yeah. Uh, it is going to get colder. Yeah. Uh, even colder than what we're dealing with now. Uh, and that mild air that's sitting on top of Michigan is on its way out to be replaced uh, by this burst of cold air. Now, it's not going to be anything ridiculous. We're not looking at uh, below zero temperatures, but compared to where we have been uh, for the last several weeks, uh, this is definitely going to be a little bit of a change in pattern and We've got snowfall to go with it, especially as we start closing the books on the week and getting into Sunday. Kind of an eerie shot downtown with the uh, raindrops on the lens and some of those low clouds out there. 40 degrees is our temperature, and that is going to be one of the warmest numbers that we are going to see for about 10 days. Wind chill right now matching the temperature because we don't have the winds to contend with. We're really paying attention to what's going on out to the west. Now, this little swirl here does have some snow associated with it. This is not going to be our main player, but it is enough to trigger a winter storm watch for the western uh, portion of the state, and that runs until Friday at 3 o'clock, so they are expecting a little bit more as far as accumulating snow there. But we will get some lake effect snow showers off of that system. You see the cold front actually comes through tonight fairly dry, and then we start getting the circulation around that low really getting ginned up on Thursday, and that will bring some of those snow showers possibly on this side of the state. But again, most of the activity will be in western Michigan. It will be enough, uh, maybe in some of those persistent bands, it could sit on the grass in a couple spots. But as we told you at the top of the show, the real deal, the uh, big weather makers coming on Sunday. And we'll look at that in a second. Here are the lows tonight. Uh, waking up tomorrow morning right around 30 degrees in the city. Most people are going to be seeing low temperatures in the 20s as we start out tomorrow. 26 out in Adrian, 26 in Onstead, 25 in Marinci. Some of our coolest numbers that we're looking at for tomorrow uh, morning starts. Lows anywhere between 27 and 28 generally here in our west zone and in our north zone slightly warmer uh, especially down here towards m59 you'll be around 30 degrees in rochester hills and macomb and then those numbers become the upper 20s as you work your way into sanilac county so otherwise temperatures tomorrow will hit a high of 36 and again we will stay dry this is sort of our little buffer between the real cold air and the snow that we're expecting on thursday and friday it will be just lake effect snow showers here to close the work week but those high temperatures barely hitting 30 in the afternoon. Saturday, we get another little bit of a break. And then Sunday, when a lot of us are watching the Lions continue their trek into first place, uh, we will be getting some measurable snow. Right now, uh, if I had to make a guess, I'd say it's probably going to be an inch or two. There are some models suggesting slightly more. Uh, so, but that system is still way out to the west offshore. We got to wait till it sort of gets on shore. Right. And the right. sense change a lot between Tuesday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah. That right. No, you'll keep checking it. OK, right. Ben, thanks. thanks ben. Hi, Doc. Hey, Kimberly and Steve. Well, they're a local family with a TV rule that would be a challenge for many people to keep. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, the rule, the reward, and the inspiration behind it all. All right, but first, stories from across Michigan, including bombshell allegations in court and the murder of a West Michigan gas station worker who just vanished. They serve our country, but when some veterans come home, they struggle. I was having a very hard time. Making that call, asking for help, that's difficult too. There's a stigma attached to that. See who's helping our veterans succeed at home as we open our phone bank to servicemen and women okay. tomorrow, starting at 4. Do you have a phone number? Across Michigan this Tuesday, we're following stories from Grand Rapids and Saginaw. But we want to start in Muskegon. That's where testimony began in the hearing that will determine if there's enough evidence against the man accused of killing Jessica Haringa. Haringa disappeared in April of 2013 from a gas station while working the night shift. Jeffrey Willis is charged with abducting and killing her, though her body has not been found. Today, a customer testified she saw Willis with Haringa the night before her disappearance and that Haringa appeared to be afraid of him. A man identified as an FBI employee was arrested today after police say he walked into a gym and opened fire. Happened at 2 a.m. inside the Planet Fitness on 28th Street in Grand Rapids. Police say the 35 year old man fired several shots, also shot at a police sergeant who tried to stop him. None of the seven people who were inside the gym at the time were injured. 
That man was arrested soon afterwards out in the parking lot and police are questioning him. A Saginaw man charged with making online threats to kill police officers and judges learned his punishment today. 33 year old Billy Thompson is seen here smiling in his mugshot, but he was charged with a serious crime of using a computer to solicit murder. Police said he was behind Facebook posts threatening to kill police. Thompson pleaded guilty in October. Today he was sentenced to five years probation and also banned from using social media for five years. Well, the nation is pausing this week to remember the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Hundreds of survivors and veterans traveling to Hawaii, visiting the memorial of the site where they once served. 19 ships were sunk on that day or run aground during that surprise attack. But the most significant toll was the 2,400 Americans who lost their lives. A ceremony will be held tomorrow to honor those who served there. New at 530. Donald Trump says Air Force One's upgrade is too expensive. Seriously, but he's got a broader message. I'll explain. A bizarre apology. This is not profit, this is loss. This is a mass grave. The manager of the Oakland, California warehouse where 36 people died defends himself as new clues emerge in the criminal investigation. An 18 year old teen accused of murder pleads guilty for killing a mother of two in a carjacking attempt. I'm Nick Monticelli. Why another plea almost happened in court today. Hi, I'm Ho Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. He's going away for a very long time. The teenager who admitted to killing a Detroit mother as she was picking up her son from basketball practice. Ralph Marshall will spend up to 60 years in prison for killing Erica Garner early this year during a carjacking. Nick Monticelli shows us the mother's young son saw it all happen and was crucial in catching the killer. Well, the outcome here was essentially set in stone with Marshall pleading guilty to second degree murder for killing Erica Garner, a mother of two young children. But there was still a twist. Her life was worth more than a car. One by one, the family of Erica Garner spoke today of what life is missing after mm -hmm. Ralph Marshall shot and killed her in a carjacking Realize. attempt. It happened in January of this year. Garner was picking up her 11 year old son from basketball practice. Instead, Marshall pointed a gun at her. She tried speeding off, but Marshall shot and killed her. Her son, now 12 years old, saw the whole thing and gave a vivid description to police. They spotted Marshall, chased him, and arrested him. Erica also leaves behind a 16-year-old daughter as well as her son, who came to court today proud he was able to help catch his mom's killer. I can stand up straight and, like, I'm brave because I came here today. And that's about it. You take care of your sister? Yeah. Or is she taking care of you? Yeah, a little bit both. Before 18-year-old Ralph Marshall was sentenced, he asked for forgiveness. I'm sorry for what happened that day, my role that I play in it. I pray that the family forgive me, and I thank God for showing me the right way. Erica's cousin, Harold Bush, says he has forgiven Marshall, but still believes his sentence, 25 to 60 years, isn't enough. It's not worth the time he has. The sentence it wasn't worth the time, the way he took. He took my cousin away. He took. Um, a mother two young kids away. Now the twist was Marshall was going to plead guilty for another case, a carjacking and assault a few days before he killed Garner, but appeared he didn't really know what he was doing in that case, so that case will still move to trial. At the Frank Murphy Hall of Justice, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Marshall also has to pay about $2,000 in fees. There was an accomplice charged in the case, but a jury found him not guilty last month. The man who turned an empty warehouse into an artist's colony is speaking for the first time after that warehouse burned down and killed 36 people over the weekend. Jennifer Brooklyn is in Oakland now with new information on the investigation. That building is 85% cleared now, and while they don't expect to find any more human remains, they won't stop until everyone's accounted for. Heartbreaking stories of loss coming out of memorials for the 36 confirmed dead here at the ghost ship, which is now a gutted hull. As flames chewed the warehouse late Friday, people trapped inside had time to text their goodbyes. It happened so fast. Carmen Brito says the fire broke out next to her room. And I wish I could give a reason why I'm alive when so many other people are, and I can't. 
I don't know. The warehouse leased to Derek Almeida three years ago was never meant to be living space, but that's what it turned into with artists and at-risk youth. He told NBC News the collective was meant to be a safe haven for them. Did we make changes? Like, I would like to say we made improvements. We've done everything that we possibly could afford to do. A musician who was playing there that night stepped outside. outside for a cigarette and watched as the fire exploded in front of him, his friends trapped inside. I just watched the exit and waited to see if my friends would come out, to see if anyone would come out, and nobody did. The building was cited multiple times for blight, twice in the last month for clutter and graffiti. And while crews don't expect to find any more victims' remains now, they won't stop until they're sure. We're going to continue the process until absolutely every piece of debris is removed from this building. Every area has been searched. Looking for answers in the ashes as the missing are identified and families wait for news they don't want to hear. That news has come from most of the families here, but the work is nowhere near done as the coroner has to reconcile the list of the missing with the remains that are still unidentified. In Oakland, Jennifer Bjorklund, Local 4. The district attorney says it is too early to determine if anyone will face criminal charges. Those won't be decided until the investigation is finished and the building has been cleared. Crews are about 85% done. The man who allegedly shot and killed former NFL running back Joel McKnight has been arrested now. 55-year-old Ronald Gasser was questioned by police on Thursday after he shot McKnight three times following a road rage incident. Police originally let Gasser go, but after further investigation, they arrested and then charged him with manslaughter. McKnight played four years in the NFL for the New York Jets and Kansas City Chiefs. He was just 28 years old. An Ohio firefighter was shot Monday night while responding to a house fire. This happened in Youngstown as the firefighter was leaving the scene. That's when the suspect opened fire on the fire truck and then hit the officer. He was taken to a hospital and is expected to fully recover. Police believe the shooter used a rifle, although he fled the scene before police arrived. He remains at large tonight in the Youngstown area. Donald Trump says it just costs too much. Trump tweeted that he plans to cancel the order for new Air Force One jumbo jets. He says they're too expensive. The president-elect hopes to convince federal contractors to charge less. Steve Handelsman is following this story from Washington. Thanks. Good evening. This is a Trump move to convince voters that he's serious about shaking up Washington. If an airline goes to buy a 747, it's about $400 million. The president-elect says a 500% markup for the Air Force One version is ridiculous. Donald Trump surprised camera crews on the surprise issue. The cost of two new Air Force Ones to replace the old 747 used today by President Obama and its backup. The Pentagon confirms Boeing will bill at least $4 billion. I think it's ridiculous. I think Boeing is doing a little bit of a number. We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. Cancel order, Trump tweeted. Boeing promised to deliver the best planes for the president at the best value for the American taxpayer. But just today, the Washington Post reported the Pentagon hid a study revealing $125 billion in waste. Boeing Trump is warning money, contractors. This government is not going to be taken as a sucker, that they're going to find good deals and that that's how he plans on running the government. Trump vows a crackdown on foreign trade deals warning he'd slap tariffs on goods from China and Mexico so jobs stay in the U.S., convincing Mike Pence who to oppose tariffs. I'm for us putting everything on the table in negotiations. Not tariffs, say Republican leaders in Congress. China could tax our products. We think the real solution here is comprehensive across-the-board tax reform, which is what we're going to be hitting the ground running on. In New York, Trump was back at the cameras. This is Masa of SoftBank from Japan. And he's just agreed to invest $50 billion in the United States and 50,000 jobs. Wow. Details are unclear, but Trump is taking credit. Tonight, he's on stop two of his thank you tour in North Carolina, where Trump is sure to brag that he's already bringing back jobs. From Washington, Steve Handelsman, Local 4. All right, Steve. Vice President Joe Biden also making news of his own. At the end of a Senate session last night, Biden told reporters he may leave the door open for a possible White House run in 2020. Also, reporters asked him about it again today, giving him a chance to say, ah, I was just kidding. 
And Biden said, well, I'm not committing to not running. I'm not committing to anything. So who knows? Are we really talking about 2020 already? <laughs> Time to start the campaign, <laughs> oh, I guess. No. Uh, grand opening today on a new facility to rescue and provide safe haven to our four-legged friends in need. Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan helped cut the ribbon today on the new Detroit Animal Care and Control Headquarters, located on 7401 Chrysler Drive. The building was a donation from the Michigan Humane Society so that adequate space could be provided to hundreds of stray cats and dogs rescued in the city. Ben is back with us now, and tonight, in addition to his job of providing Detroit's most accurate weather forecast, <laughs> I got a 20 in here. So he will <laughs> also make a special appearance on Jeopardy. Yeah, this is really cool. You're yeah. you're doing is it Detroit trivia? Is that uh, clues across America. So okay. they had different people do clues from different parts of the country. So I'm going to be focused specifically on Detroit. How cool. Yeah, I mean, when Trebek says, you know, you got to come, you got yeah. to do what he says. Answer so the call, man. Here's a little bit about what we did. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Bailey with Local 4. Detroit is the seat of this county, whose name honors a Revolutionary War general. Mm. Wow, you had really good lighting on that one. You want that you, one? I was more, yeah, Go. do you know it? No? I'll let you take it. The county Detroit is in. Oh, wait. You gotta pause oh, I was just You gotta it. pause the What is that? I'm so bad at that whole questiony thing. I got it. What is Wayne County, Alex? There you go. And since you got it right, we'll give you a Jeopardy hat. Uh -huh. Thank you. See, that's why I would never do well on that. Although, you know, I thought the county was named after Wayne Fonts, not some old general. <laughs> you learn so much. <laughs> I, we do what we can here. Now we have Thank to say, take note, that's not, like you said, that's not the question that's going to be on the show. Yeah, we shot like an hour and a half worth of stuff, and I think they used about 10 seconds. So you don't look blink, you'll miss it. You but did. that's very fun. It was cool. That's yeah. Great. We'll look for you there. That's on at 7.30, 7 tonight. Right, right here at Local 4. Floor. Sounds really good. Good deal. Your mom is going to love it. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty, thank you. A man manages to steal an $80,000 car from a Troy dealership, and he made it look pretty easy. New tonight, how he managed to have the car delivered right to him and just drive away. And this is Russia's only aircraft carrier. It has a big problem. It's what the ship can't do that puts pilots in extreme danger. So what are the TV time rules in your house? Well, we met a local family with one that would be a challenge for many to keep. Coming up, the rule, the reward, and the inspiration behind it all. On Jeopardy. New at 6. Those of us with driver's licenses admit it. We've all done it. A couple times I was trying not to nod off while driving, and it was a 40-minute drive back to work. But it is infinitely more dangerous than we might have thought. We'll tell you exactly what it equates to and how surprising that is ahead. Plus, a Ford of the future. A new feature will be included in some new car models. How it could potentially save your life. In good health, very many families have rules about TV time. But one local family we met has a rule many might find pretty hard to keep. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is here with their story and really the inspiration behind it. That's exactly it. You know, we were interviewing the Orr family from East Point for a story about screen time when they told us they don't allow their kids to watch TV during the school week at all. So we wanted to hear more about how they make it work and the impact they say that it's had on their family. You have to pull out from these. Games aren't just for family game night in the Orr household. On weeknights, there's no TV allowed. It's a rule nine-year-old Ahmad and 10-year-old Amir know well, along with the reasoning behind it. If we watch TV all the time, we won't f focus on our schoolwork and we'll never get it done. Rihanna and Demetrius came up with the idea about five years ago after seeing an interview with President Obama. It was a, it was a conversation about um, habits of successful people and watching television was not one of those. They say at first, the boys didn't even notice. We didn't tell them. We just stopped making it available. So when we came home, if they asked, it was like, oh, or we can get a book. Or, we you know, we can play a game. Yep. We just offered other suggestions. Then at some point, they consciously heard us having the conversation with someone else. Like, oh, yeah, they don't watch TV during the week. And Amir was like, we don't. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> the boys are plenty busy. We play lots of sports like baseball, basketball, and soccer. Mm -hmm and bowling. 
But the family admits the rule has been more challenging with five-year-old Ariana. It was right when she turned three that it cut off for her too. It was a lot more difficult for her. She didn't have sports in the evening and homework and so it was more work on us because we had to fully entertain her. The Oars say turning off the TV has turned on their kids' creativity. Books are their television, so it gives them room to expand their mind on knowledge. And help them excel academically. I need to make sure that you can be competitive, that you need to be able to get a job, you need to be able to take care of yourself. And SpongeBob cannot get you there. He just can't. And if there were no rules? Every kid in the whole entire world would just be watching TV, <laughs> play video games all the time. It would be crazy because we would watch TV all the time. <laughs> yeah. And we'd be lazy. But that won't happen here. You got to be able to step outside the norm. You got to step outside the box, and there's more room outside the box than it is in it. Now, when Amir and Ahmad say when they have their own family someday, they plan to keep the rule because they don't want their kids to be lazy either. Now, of course, there are exceptions for special events like this past Summer Olympics, and Demetrius will sometimes DVR basketball games as well for them to watch together, but on the weekends. Wow. You got to give them credit. It's, it's got to be hard socially, though, because some of the kids must mm -hmm. be watching other shows. And they talk about them. Yeah. And, right. How do they yeah. react to what's cool or what's in? Yeah, well, apparently it's not really so hard for the boys. They don't really necessarily feel like they're missing anything out because they actually have something to do all the time and they can watch some TV on the weekends. But it's been harder for Ariana, the daughter, because she's not as busy. And that's harder on mom and dad as well, of course, because they've stuck with it. And that means they have to spend a lot more time yes, with their they kids, do. They which is really good, though. Oh, yeah, what a great investment in their children. You That's know? exactly and right. Even if you can't do the whole rule, at least make that part of your lifestyle. That's exactly right. Yeah. You got to baby steps. All right. You can't watch the news, but you can go to click on Detroit and get all the news. <laughs> there you, you go. Miss <laughs> Bernie. <laughs> well, you know, like get those TVs like we have at home, only Channel 4. We yeah, have nothing else. <laughs> That's all. This is like a right.